Hey all, here are OS Reviews. Today we're taking a revisited look back at the Sony VAIO P-Series. This is the second gen model from 2010, making it over a decade old, but it still looks incredibly sleek and unique from a design perspective with this ultra-wide 8-inch display that kind of is similar, in fact, to Sony's latest Xperia 1 series smartphones and having that 21 by 9 aspect ratio widescreen, which is great for content consumption and watching videos. This was at a time where most netbooks looked something like this. And to those unfamiliar with netbooks, they were essentially a category of compact computers, perhaps not as powerful, often in fact running on Intel Atom processors, but easier to carry one on the road, and served as a transition point to ultra-portables, as well as Chromebooks, which are popular these days. I'll also say that prior to the release of the P-series, Sony was also known for making other ultra-compact computers, including their Vile UX line that was more of a UMPC, aka ultra mobile PCs, that had a slide out keyboard, a screen size that's actually quite similar around 5 to 6 inches to smartphones that we have today that can fit in your palm, and it runs on a full version of Windows XP or Windows 7. So this is very similar in terms of performance and horsepower, but just in a slightly more conventional clam top form factor, which is also just a touch larger, but kind of a blend, I would say, of a netbook and a UMPC. But design is is obviously at the forefront of the P-series, and Sony actually came out with a variety of vibrant eye-catching colors, including this incredibly fresh neon green, there's even pinks, orange, and of course a more classic black and white theme could also be found. To be honest, I kind of miss the days when tech used to be a lot more colorful, including iPods if you guys recall. That being said, a modern equivalent of something like this would probably be the GDP microcomputers, which also are on the market, running on, say, Windows 10 or Windows 11, also having a small keyboard, can be thought of as a spiritual successor in many ways with more refreshed and powerful internals. But Sony's design, I have to say, was really ahead of its time. In recent years, we have seen a bit of a resurgence in microcomputers in general, with popular gaming form factors, including the Steam Deck, continuing to gain traction. Obviously, these devices are going to be more powerful in their GPU, and they're more designed exclusively for gaming, but it's also brought back a bit of a resurgence, I would argue, in having more experimental form factors on computers in general. Granted, the Vial P series was never the most powerful computers, which is kind of expected considering the emphasis on style as well as the limited frame and size. However, what is great is the second gen model was using an SSD, a 128GB or 256GB drive, so at least loading times and read and write speeds are actually quite fast compared to the majority of other netbooks which were still using hard drives that tended to be more slow and required more power as well to operate. However, it was still using an Intel Atom processor, the Z530, uh, clocked up to 2 GHz. This model, though, does come with a built-in accelerometer, so you can tilt the screen into the taller portrait orientation if you're reading a book, for instance, kind of interesting. And there's optional cellular as well with 3G and GPS on board, in addition to built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. The entire package, by the way, weighs in at less than 1.3 pounds, pretty much half the weight of most other small netbooks even. So anyways, the main chassis here is built out of polycarbonate plastic, but it doesn't feel too cheap. Uh, still has a reassuring overall feeling to it. I love kind of the rounded corners, giving it almost an envelope-like design, which has held up extremely well. Otherwise, we have a two-tone finish with some black accents along the sides, the left-hand spine housing a USB Type A port. There's also a full HDMI port, which is really impressive to see on such a small compact computer. It's kind of a shame that I.O. is getting increasingly rare on modern day computers, especially ultra portables, where we have essentially just a Type C port and that is it. Anyways, on the other spine, there's access to the charging port, as well as a second USB Type A port, 3.5 millimeter headphone jack port, and also a switch that you can use to manually turn on and off wireless connectivity. Furthermore, on the front of the laptop is where you can find a full-size SD card reader plus Sony's own Magic Gate card reader, similar to what you can use on PSPs, for example. Here's how it stacks up with a more modern Ultra Portable, something like a Pixelbook that has a 12.5-inch screen. You can tell just how much smaller this thing is. The back here houses a lanyard strap, as well as a battery compartment that can be removed. It housed either a standard 2,500 milliamp hour capacity battery, or there was an optional extended 5,000 milliamp hour capacity pack. Even the charger was this incredibly compact and cute little adapter that makes it easy to transport when on the go. 
the standard cell was sufficient for around four hours of endurance on average. So you're not talking about a huge battery endurance champion here, uh, but overall that kind of makes sense given the small size, although Chromebooks and more recent ultra portables have definitely improved on the battery front. That beautiful, almost piano-like black and white finish persists on the inside with these delicate rounded corners and also a scissor-style keyboard that has decent traction and feedback as you're typing down on it. You'll also notice that there isn't really a conventional trackpad down below here. Instead, they're using a ThinkPad inspired nub on the middle for you to navigate around. Alternatively, there is a mouse or a mini trackpad, I would say, on the top of the screen here, this square region that you can interact with, along with mouse control keys for left and right on the display itself that you can hold as an optional second way of navigation, almost like in a aforementioned Steam Deck or a gaming mini computer if you're using it in this particular method compared to the keypad down below. Now you'll also find access to a few special keys on the bottom here, including a web and assist button. And these are shortcuts to quickly jump into a simplified operating system. Essentially it's a dual boot. Instead of going to the full Windows OS, if you're in a hurry and you just wanna search something on Google, you can tap on web and it will instantly turn on and within just 10 seconds or so, boot into more of a simplified Linux operating system, giving you a desktop class web browser. So that comparison with Chromebooks is really fitting if you don't want to boot all the way into regular Windows. Very neat idea, and it still functions here. You will notice that this particular version of the Sony VIOP is actually the Korean version. Specs and design is all the same, it's just that the language version of Windows is different. But here we can see jumping into Google, it is loading along just fine. I even tap on this Halloween themed banner here to read back a little bit more. And this is a pretty good display for its time. It's slightly higher than HD resolution, which on a panel size like this still looks relatively sharp, I would say. This is compared to the majority of netbooks from this era having only 480p screens by comparison. So it looked great. However, one downside, it is going to make icons and fonts a little bit smaller as well. You can blow that up yourself under advanced settings, but it is something to keep in mind out of the box. It's kind of what it looks like. So anyways, closing out of the splash top Linux operating system here, the dual boot, we can jump into the full Windows environment just by tapping the power key here on the top. And to be completely honest, even the full Windows environment is honestly not that slow at all to boot into. In most cases, taking just around 20 seconds or so to fully initialize, in large part due to the faster SSD as compared to a spinning hard drive, which was still kind of the norm back then. A couple other quick things to note though was a backlit keyboard is not something you're gonna, so typing in darker environments can be a little bit challenging. Uh, that being said, this device does have a webcam, it is located just a little bit higher than the small trackpad there on the display. What's neat is Sony also built some of their own UI elements on top of Windows, including kind of brightness controls uh, that all looks quite neat and fits in with the entire design aesthetic that they've gone for here. What I will say though is that the hinge only goes back by about this amount. You can't really snap it completely flat, nor is it going to be a 360 kind of convertible design, which really wasn't popularized until a few years afterwards. So while on the topic of design, I'll say that when it comes to aesthetics, this one along with the Nokia booklet are my two two favorite netbooks from this era. So the booklet we actually did a revisited review on a while back. Many folks may not remember that Nokia actually did try to make a Windows computer and they styled it very similar to their Lumia series phones with some of the polycarbonates and sharp angles which also looks incredibly good. Nokia's laptop on the other hand has a more conventional aspect ratio and also a slightly heavier build. It's actually constructed out of aluminum. It has a hinge that you can just open with one hand, so it feels very robust, similar to a MacBook. Now, by the way, some of the slight interference and flickering that you see is just due to the camera. It's not something that you can actually see in person. Otherwise, this really wide aspect ratio does pose to be a little challenging for certain applications. In fact, I personally have found that putting the taskbar here on the side maybe occupies a little bit less of the precious vertical space on this panel, but you can choose just by dragging that up and down. And otherwise it is a regular Windows computer, albeit one that is of course aging and not the fastest processor or really GPU anymore, but you can still browse the web, view back files using a thumb drive, as well as create some quick notes and documents on Word, and that all functions as you would expect, as long as you have a little bit of patience. That being said, as long as you give it a few, again, extra seconds, things will still render, but obviously it's not going to be the fastest experience anymore unless you're looking at super simple content. And 
This thing is coupled with 2GB of RAM, which was pretty much the norm for all netbooks from that era, but the beauty of a full Windows computer means that you can install legacy programs. Anything that is designed for Windows x86, including drivers for printers, can all be easily compatible on this machine uh, as compared to, say, other Linux devices. That being said, I would say watching back videos if you're streaming it on YouTube or Netflix is not going to be the best idea if you are still using the default uh, system with regular say Chrome, since everything is going to be so slow, you'll have to expect more drop frames as well and occasional moments of hesitation, but this gives you a quick idea of how YouTube will perform on this machine. So it's not going to be the best experience I would say, but still is kind of usable. Wi-Fi reception at the very least seems to be decent, so loading times and buffering doesn't seem to be at least too problematic, but I would personally suggest keeping videos really at 480p for the best experience. Anything higher resolution, it's going to struggle a lot more. Also, despite this being a very good display for its time in terms of sharpness, keep in mind that it was a TN panel, meaning that if you are shifting the viewing angles too dramatically, colors will still look a little bit more off. But again, that was par for the course back in 2010. The speaker quality on the unit is also a little on the soft side, and to be honest, a little bit tinny if we're being super critical, uh, but overall I would say it's not too surprising for a small, kind of pocket-sized computer in general, there's not too much room on here. Now one other thing that you kind of saw earlier though was when watching back some regular 16 by 9 aspect ratio videos, there was some pretty significant black bars going on. However, just like what we said about the Sony Xperia 1 smartphones, when you do find content that aligns to a wider, say 21 by 9 widescreen form, it becomes a lot more cinematic and a really magical experience, almost like you're watching it in a movie theater with that kind of overall form that you're looking at. That being said, again, content is still kind of rare uh, on the market that is in this particular aspect ratio, so the majority of stuff that you're looking at will still have a bit more black bars if you're consuming videos. Here's also a quick demo of browsing the web and loading back a web page like The Verge. It is kind of the opposite of something like a iPad, which goes purposefully for more of a boxy 4x3 aspect ratio that is closer to a piece of paper when you're looking at documents and the web. But with just a little bit more patience and scrolling, it can still be a usable experience, surprisingly, on here. So kind of neat to see. Otherwise, all other elements of this computer are as expected for a Windows machine. You can open a file manager, and here's what it's like if you are using this for a little bit of typing. You can see that you can open up a notepad as well as things like PowerPoint, and they will still mostly function. Simple tasks like this. Now one other remark is that despite this using the Intel Atom processor, the Vial P-Series is a mostly silent machine. That's also quite atypical even for ultra portables and netbooks for its time that still had some sort of active fan to cool things down. Uh, the benefit here is that you don't hear really any noise at all as you're working. It's silent, just like on our smartphones. The downside though is it can get a little bit warmer around the center keyboard region if you're pressing it harder for say longer than 30 minutes or so. But overheating per se is not really a huge problem either. And similarly, if you're trying to use this for anything more demanding like gaming, well, it's just not gonna be a good idea unless you're playing something super simple. For instance, Minesweeper, as well as maybe some puzzle type games uh, that are built directly into Windows, things like that can still run okay. Anything more extensive is just not gonna be a great experience unless you're looking at really old uh, kind of 90 style emulation titles, then perhaps it can still be an okay option. But in general, I would say horsepower is not the forte of the Vile P series. It's mainly all about the style, doing the basics in terms of document editing, as well as some very light web browsing. So that is more or less it as far as our revisited look at the rather beautiful and kind of iconically designed uh, file P-series, the second gen model here from Sony, and more than anything, I just think that it's a really experimental and unique computer with this ultra-wide aspect ratio screen. It's a bit of a shame that we don't really see Sony making laptops and computers which are super popular anymore these days especially from a brand that was once such a dominant and innovative player on the tech space. However, on their smartphones at the very least, we can still see some of their stubbornness in terms of adopting similarly unique design traits with that ultra-wide aspect ratio, and that's actually really cool to see when looking back. And the Vial P, although it isn't going to be the most powerful computer by far, I think it still is undeniably a really cool piece of tech history. So let us know in the comments down below, have you owned one of the Vial P's back in the day or any other piece of Sony tech that you feel nostalgic about? But for now, that's been our video. You can learn more details if interested in the links down below. Thanks for watching here at OS Reviews. That's been the Vial P series.